Um, welcome, everybody. It's great that such a vast number of you have found time on a Wednesday afternoon to attend this talk. Thanks for being here. So I believe the lecture and webinar was built as language at work. What you see here is language in the workplace amounts to the same thing, really. Contents haven't changed because of that. Good. So just a few words about who I am. So my name is Veronica Koller. I work at the Department of Linguistics and English Language at Lancaster University. And I believe I'm in my 17th year now, so I've been around for a while, um, which I guess reflects positively on the department. My interests as a researcher, as a linguist, are in corporate communication. You won't be surprised to hear that. I'm also, and especially recently, interested in political discourse. And I, have for a long time, done um, research on language and gender as well. Outside academia, I do the occasional freelance work uh, in language and communications consulting. So I freelance for an agency that specializes in language consulting. So that's very nice how that, you know, the practice there informs my research and vice versa, but also my teaching. And in terms of teaching at the Department uh, of Linguistics at Lancaster, I teach discourse analysis, at various levels. Just before I came here, as it were, I've taught a number of PhD students. I also teach MA and undergraduates. And of course, I also teach corporate communication, which is a very long standing interest of mine. Good. Um, I have, given that interest, I have co-authored a textbook together with my brilliant colleague, Erica Durridge, which is on corporate communication and business discourse. And I'm also one of the three hosts uh, of a podcast called Words and Actions, which looks at how language matters in business, politics and beyond. We've just released episode 16, it is by now already. So that's a bit about my background. Let's begin with thinking about language in the workplace, language at work. So when I've asked, given this to a smaller audience, I would usually ask people, um, you know, what do you expect language in the workplace or language in the workplace? Yes, please turn off your microphone. OK, I'm sorry that you can't hear anything, but please do turn off your microphone. Good. OK, so um, obviously we have about 300 people, so it's not really practical to ask people. But when I've asked this question in a shorter, in smaller contexts, I've got very different um, answers. So people on the one hand, they said, oh, language at work, language in the workplace, it's really formal you know, um, and it's very hierarchical. There's lots of power involved. OK, but on the other hand, people would also say, oh, it's really informal. There's lots of chatting. There's lots of small talk. There's lots of what we linguists call phatic communication. OK, so things where you don't necessarily want to transmit information, but you're chatting just to sort of uh, keep your work relationships going. You ask about how was your weekend, you know, how was your son's birthday, that sort of thing. So it's both formal and hierarchical and informal and non-hierarchical. And then people said, well, it's also really you have a lot of jargon. You have a lot of technical terms and or, you know, abbreviations that nobody understands. And the point is, of course, everybody's right. Because workplaces, a lot of stuff happens at workplaces or indeed at schools or universities. If you're to listen to the woman, I can't hear her. Can you please turn off whoever was asking probably that child to be quiet? Could you please turn off your microphone? Thank you. I'm homeschooling as well. It's tricky. I know. <laughs> Good. So we get these different reactions. It's formal, it's hierarchical language at work, it's informal, it's chatty, it's very equal, it's laden with technical terms. So and all of this is correct because of how diverse workplaces are. So there's anything from corridor. Well, we don't really have corridors anymore, but chats on, you know, uh, an online platform. Um, you know this, but then there's also more formal meetings, but it's very clear who has what kind of role, right? Um, and then there's also, of course, uh, a lot of what we call in-group language. So um, where you can expect people 
to know what an acronym means or you can uh, expect them to have particular technical terminology because you're all working in an engineering business, for instance. So all of this is true because it is a very, very diverse kind of language setting, if you will. Good. How does that relate to corporate communication more broadly? So workplace language, language at work, language in the workplace is um, part of what we could call corporate communication. A lot of research has been done of it. It's a very important part, but it's only one part because we could say that more broadly, corporate communication really is language use in and by companies. Some people call that business communication as well. Some people would look more broadly and look at professional communication, where they also look at, for instance, how doctors talk uh, or how judges talk or what have you. Some people would also extend that to nonprofit organizations. So things like hospitals, schools, universities, charities, you name it, really. So we could, you know, I usually define it a bit more narrowly just to know what we're all talking about, which is language use in and by companies. And the guiding question there is when we look at language at work is um, who's communicating here, who's speaking or writing or texting or chatting, who with, by what means? Is it spoken? Is it written? Is it an online chat? What is it? And what are they trying to do? What are they, is their purpose or their ends? Are they trying to chair a meeting? Are they trying to uh, develop a strategy? At the workplace, are they trying to um, say who's responsible for what task at work? And what are their conditions? Um, is it very rushed? Is it time sensitive? Is it uh, among equals? Is there a lot of hierarchy in the room? Is there conflict among people? So all of these things will influence how people use language, be that written, spoken or whatever. So when we look at language at work, these other kinds of questions we need to ask ourselves. We can also, within corporate communication, look at broader things or broader perspectives. So we can say, well, one perspective we can take is that of the company as an organization. OK, so um, and in that aspect, you could look at brand communication or how companies talk to customers and indeed how customers talk back because they do so an awful lot these days on social media, for instance, and how do brands, for instance, engage with people on social media? Um, there's a lot of work also, for instance, on crisis communication, whatever crisis that may be, there's certainly no shortage of them, really. But another perspective would that be that of management. So a really hot topic within business communication is leadership communication. So how do people use language in order to be a particular kind of leader. So say a very assertive leader, perhaps even authoritarian leader, or you know, a reader who or a leader who looks uh, for lots of participation from their team members, etc. So people have looked really at the nitty gritty of language use in that regard. How do people use language um, to um, bring about change companies? And also, um, relatively recent area, um, how is language used when people start to get their company off the ground, entrepreneurs. So lots and lots of different things to look at. And then, of course, and that's what we'll be focusing on today, we can look from the perspective of employees. So we can look at the whole process of joining a workplace. So from reading a job ad or whatever it happens to be, to applying for a job, through going through that interview, etc. And then when you are part of a workplace, um, maybe just for a placement or it may be long term, how do you interact in that workplace? You know, how do you uh, interact in meetings or how do you interact with uh, line managers? How do you use language to do that? And how do the line managers talk to you about you in order to, you know, uh, convey what the ideal employee is? So in a lot of job ads, they have sort of baked in in the language, you know, what kind of person they want to apply and who need not bother. Um, so that's a way of what you could call using language to construct ideal employees. OK, so that's really the area for today. That's language in the workplace. So that's where that sits within corporate communication. 
Good. Let's look at an example and uh, something that I think because I believe that many of you are students in years 11, 12, 13, maybe. OK, um, so an example of a company recruiting school leavers. So people who are about to or have to left school. And again, can I ask people to please turn off their microphones because otherwise I hear myself with a lack of three seconds, which is very, very confusing. OK, so please put your microphones on. Mute. Thank you. OK, so the company I've chosen is uh, IBM for no particular reason, really. You know, I don't get paid for them. I've never worked for them. But I've noticed that uh, many of their communications, they are quite interesting, really. So I've given you the web. There. They have a whole brochure just for school leavers. And they give you this decision tree diagram. You know, do you know what you want to do after your A-levels? text or whatever it happens to be. So yes, not sure. And we look at the um, we look at the uh, not sure because what they are advocating for believers who don't quite know what to do yet is that they are um, might apply for a gap year with IBM, so have a placement an extended placement with a company for a year, and then find clarity if they want to study next or stay with the company or whatever they want to do. Good. Okay. I hope everybody has now turned off their microphones. It was really helpful. Thank you. Good. Okay. So we're looking at this, what they call futures, and it's a placement scheme with the company for 12 months for a gap year, basically. Good. Okay. So you have the link to the text if you want to follow that. You can copy it from the previous slide and have a look at it, although you don't have to. So this is um, addressing schooling, and I want to have a look a bit at how this text, the company is interacting with uh, people who are about to leave school or have recently left school. It's not a real dialogue, of course. So here, that's people probably sat in front of a computer reading this brochure, but the company makes it sound as if they are talking to the reader face to face, something we call personalization. And it's very frequently found in the language used by companies. OK, good. And what let's look at then how they interact with the reader. And again, they do it in quite contradictory ways. So on the one hand, we can see if we look at the text and I'll give you some examples from that, that they actually restrict the reader quite a lot because they don't just want anyone to apply. Right. So it's quite a you know, stringent select selection process. So they make sure pretty much from the start, you know, who need not apply. So they have requirements. And in a more personal way, they say you will also need to, for instance, have your A-levels or equivalent. And then they make very clear you are not eligible if. So oh, there's like going on, you know. So that's a sort of restriction, really, to make sure that people don't waste their time and the company's time applying when they're not eligible. But then they also offer choices to the reader. So the people who are eligible to apply get offered lots of choices in the language. So they call their placement scheme, their gap year scheme, a try before you commit scheme. And they say it's in your hands. So using that metaphor here, you know, to say it's your decision. And indeed, they say as much. They say the choice is yours, exclamation mark. And they also use this construction that we call a conditional clause, where they say, um, if you would like this, that or the other, then you could do that. Okay. So putting in that conditional there to indicate in the language how much choice the reader really has. And they do a lot about involving the reader. So there's various ways how we can use language to involve a reader, even if that reader is not present. How we can simulate a dialogue, if you will. Good. Um, so questions is one of them. What will you do? So that makes it necessary for the reader to think, hmm, yeah, what will I do once I've got my A-levels? And they use direct address an awful lot. So the second person pronoun, you. You, your, yours. So as if they were speaking to somebody from face to face. Did a little counting exercise 
and uh, they use youth. So the text itself is not very long, only 240 words. Okay. And, uh, but within those 240 words, they use uh, you or yours 20 times. Um, and if you are a bit of a numbers nerd like I am, you can then sort of break that down and say, oh, well, that is 8.3 times per 100 words. Now, the question is, is that a lot? Is that not a lot? And that question is a how long is a piece of string kind of question, right? We'll contrast that with something else. It is, relatively speaking, quite a lot. OK, in a minute, we'll have a look at a very different recruitment text. And another thing that they do is that they characterize the reader. So they not only restrict, you know, who need not apply and who they would like to apply, but they also sort of try and empathize with the reader what they might be like. So you might be uncertain if that's you. So and then they talk about a head start in your career, which is a rather subtle move because they use your here. Yeah, so your career, which sort of implies that it's a foregone conclusion that this person will have a career, that they are interested, you know, in something like a professional career. And they say what you will do, so you will learn, obviously, because you'll be very junior, but also they say you will support experienced professionals. You also have, you have it in you to support them, so they characterize them. But let's get back to the reader involvement there. So we said they use a lot of that pronoun, you, your, yours. And we said, OK, so is that a lot? And if we, for instance, contrast it with um, another text, that's a recruitment um, thing that I looked at um, a while ago. So that was a recruitment brochure sort of at the other end of the career ladder, if you will. That was a recruitment brochure for a senior manager at my own university. OK, so uh, and at that level, you have whole image brochures and, you know, because you want to make the employer look attractive as well, etc. Um, so and there you find, you know, the text is, has, if you look in relative figures, it has zero instances of you at all. So when they talk about the reader, they talk about the role or the role holder or the post, the post will do that. The role holder will also do that. The role is expected to, etc. Right. So when we have 8.3 instances of you in 100 words in this text for school leavers, in this other text for the senior manager, you know, where they look for a senior manager, you have zero per 100. So very, very impersonal. And relatively speaking, this it's, you know, involves the reader a lot, so it's quite personal. I did mention that this case study, this example that we're using, this gap year, is, has a very stringent um, application process come with it in five steps, right? So you can see that here. So there's a lot of hoops to jump through because it's a very sought after post. And they do talk a bit about their website and what I said earlier in terms of constructing employees. Yeah? So what kind of people do they want to apply? A certain, you know, uh, criteria where you need not apply. But what people, what kind of people do they want to apply? So you do not need any prior work experience. And then they give lots of attributes. They say we're looking for enthusiastic, driven and innovative individuals. The passion for business and technology. Okay, could that be me? And then they talk about their core competencies, etc. So they sort of sketch a picture of the ideal person they want to take up that gap year placement. Let's have a look at one step in this application procedure, and that is the sort of in the middle, and that's the application form. So where you then um, that's basically the letter of application that you write. You've already been done, been successful in two steps. And if you're successful here, there will be two more steps to go through before you get that placement. OK, but application forms. Let's look at that and let's look at how you can use language to manage your impression when you write a letter of application or indeed in an interview. But let's look at it for the application form. So. Um, the common consensus seems to be that there's various ways of how you can give as good an impression as possible in language, using language. Now, it's important to state 
that you're, this is not an, a call to be dishonest. Okay, so impression management is not about, you know, saying something that you are not, you know, um, which is apart from the fact that it's lying and not ethical, you know, it's also not good, a good idea because you will find, be found out on your first day at the job probably. So impression management is not about dishonesty, but it's presenting yourself as you really are, but in a very favorable light. Yeah, you don't perhaps, you want to foreground your strength, you want to background your, uh, your weak spots, and you want to present things that you have achieved in a really positive light. So you want to take credit for positive events, for instance, and you want to put the I in there. You want to say, I was responsible. Yeah, so don't undersell it. Some people use name dropping, if you will. So they associate themselves with people, place, institutions, obviously those that you know are widely regarded as, um, as positive. Compliments is a strategy that some people use. So they say something positive about their would-be employer. Culturally, it can be very different how much is too much here. So in some cultures, too much of it will be seen as really cringeworthy. Whereas in other cultures, you're expected to really lay on the compliments. Otherwise, it's almost seen as rude. So there's a lot of um, things to negotiate. When you talk about what's positive about you, your positive attributes as a future employee, lots of people use intensifiers. So they not only say they're hardworking, they modify that with an adverb. They say, I'm extremely hardworking. So you intensify. And one really good strategy is also to turn specific experiences into general statements that reflect well on you. So you can say I played an active role in my study group, which is great. Yeah, but it's even greater if from that you can deduce that I am an efficient team player. OK, so hopefully you get the drift there. Good. Now, let's look a bit at um, what happens when people have made it through all that process. This is uh, an example, not from IBM now, but this is from somebody who's new in a job, who's jumped through all the hurdles. This is in a healthcare setting. And the new person there on the job is called Isaac, and his mentor uh, is called Leo. Now, this is transcribed to reflect where they talk at the same time. So when you have these square brackets, that's them talking at the same time. Um, but even if you just eyeball this, as we say, what you can really see is that Isaac is not talking an awful lot, is he? So he's basically restricted or restricting himself to nodding along linguist verbally. So he says, yes, 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 I think so. OK, so he may be this passionate, driven, enthusiastic individual, but in this interaction, you know, not much of him shines through, really. Instead, we have his mentor talking an awful lot. And there's particular things that this mentor, Leo, keeps doing in how he interacts with Isaac. So he puts a lot of obligation on him. So it's very hierarchical here. Yeah, Isaac is really this new kid on the block, block and um, Leo is his mentor. So Leo talks a lot about what his obligations are. And he uses a particular phrasing to do that. So he says a lot about, I'd like you to do. I'd like to see you do this. I just want you to do that. I want you to do this. And at one point, he turns that not just I want it, we. So the whole organization wants it. We want you to do this, etc. OK, so a lot of obligation being put on, you know, Isaac there. And um, another thing that they do, Leo does, is that he um, uses a particular metaphor here, and that's the metaphor of movement. So we can often people talk about their career as a career path, which is a metaphor, of course. So a journey that you are on and that will take you to some desired goal. Okay. So and Leo plays on this metaphor, really, not necessarily consciously, but he does. So he says, I just want you to keep going. Or he says, I want you to keep moving forward. OK, so um, and what he doesn't want is that some something might slow you down. So he uses that metaphor a lot as well. So there's sort of also an imperative 
not technically speaking, Daniel, an imperative, but an obligation that um, that he should, you know, improve himself, that he should continue to grow and learn, etc. And indeed, that that is an obligation that his mentor personally and the whole workplace collectively put on on Isaac. Good. So that is an instance of workplace language itself and interaction there. I would like to uh, finish by giving examples from two um, two school leavers, you know, reflecting on their gap year. So people who have just come finished doing a gap year after school and what they had to say about it and how they presented very differently. So let's have a look at that to close off before we go to the question. Good. So um, this is the first person talking about, you know, what their gap year, what it was good for or not. So um, they say it's been a great help with things like job interviews. Every job interview I've been to, when they've seen what I did in where they did their gap year in the workplace, they've been straight away, you've got the job. It looks really impressive. Some have been odd jobs that you just do at the student. At the moment, I'm working for a company, but I actually applied in the summer to join the police service because I'd like to be a policeman. And uh, so I went for quite an extensive, inter intensive even, intensive interview. And a lot of times I kept sort of bringing this up, this stuff about my experience. I felt confident that I could answer so many different questions, etc., etc. So um, you may, when you read this or listen to me reading this, uh, form a particular image of this person, what they're like. And people in the past have said that they sound quite confident. Yes. I mean, they do a bit of these fillers I kept sort of. Those can signal uncertainty, but they can also just be a feature of somebody's speech or it could be age related. That is peer group talks like that. So one feature doesn't always mean the same thing in language. What we can see is that um, he does say that he feels confident. OK, um, but we can also see that he, this young man, really foregrounds the I himself. So he does stuff. He does stuff in the material world, right? He did something in a workplace I'm working for. I applied, I went, I brought it up etc etc okay so he casts himself as a very very active participant when talking about the benefits of his gap year we can contrast this with this second one another person talking about their gap year and they say traveling definitely made me realize that university was right for me i know that i wanted to come back and get a better education so um yeah yeah i'm glad i took a gap year because even if i had come to university and not traveled i've been coming straight from school I just don't think I was mature enough. I'd had enough. I'm really young for my year. So already I knew I was just like, just wasn't ready at all. But the gap year definitely matured me a lot. So in terms of what this person says, um, the focus is not so much on confidence, but on maturity. So they talk about young for their age. It has matured me. I wasn't mature enough. So very different topic focus, what they're talking about. But also how they use grammar. So what you can see here is that this person, unlike the first one who said, I do this, I do that, etc., has st stuff done to them. So something made me realize I was at the receiving end. Traveling did that to me. It wasn't me doing that. Or at the end, the gap year matured me. It's just something, again, that they had done to them. And when they put themselves forward, it's not so much in material things they do, how they act on the world. It's more in terms of what they think and what they are. So, you know, in terms of meaning, you know, a not as dynamic, perhaps. So I was mature enough. I am really young. I think, etc. You may at this point be forming a very different image of that person. It may or may not surprise you that uh, the first one, the confident one, was a young man. I mentioned that, I said he, or is this is a young woman. This is obviously not representative, but when I read about that, it did give me pause for thought. But that brings us to the area of language and gender, and that is perhaps a topic for another day. I will stop here.
and I'll be very happy. I see that the chat has been very active and I'll be very happy to answer what questions I can answer. Thank you.